So in the previous class, we were talking about Banach contraction mapping theorem. Uh, no, actually two classes ago, we were talking about Banach contraction mapping theorem. And in the previous class, we, we, I had mentioned two results before we were cut off because of the internet issue. So the first result was we have a map H from RK to RK and we have a fixed point of H, which is Y star. And we know that the spectral radius of rho of gradient of H at Y star less than one. If the spectral radius of the gradient of H at Y star is less than one, then this implies that there exists a norm on RK and a neighborhood Y of RK. So, y, so this is Y is a neighborhood of neighborhood of Y star such that H from Y to Y is a contraction map. Okay, so this was the first result we had talked about yesterday uh, in on Monday. And the second result was, I have a matrix Q And I have, uh, sorry, I have a matrix A, which is comprised of four sub matrices where Q is positive definite, B is full rank. Then the real part of eigenvalues of A is strictly positive. Okay, so this was the result that I had mentioned without proof. Uh, but uh, the proof is there in the book, uh, you know, under one of the propositions. So you can take a look at it. I can refer you to it if you are interested in knowing the proof of this result, second result. Okay, so are there any questions on these two results at this time? So this was done in the previous class and I'm, I apologize for the bad connection, the internet came back up at 5 p.m. on that on Monday. So uh, hopefully you had a chance to look at the video and understand what we were talking about. But at this point of time, any questions on these two results, which we had reviewed in the previous class? Okay, so the third result, which is something I want to talk about um, is as follows. So, so I know that uh, the real part of the eigenvalues of A is going to be greater than zero. This is something that I'm aware of. Uh, let's try and understand um, how does that help us when we are doing things like gradient descent or method of multipliers. So I'm gonna talk about another minor extension of result number two. So given A, there exists alpha bar such that for all alpha in zero alpha bar, Uh, the spectral radius of rho minus alpha A is less than one. Okay, so this is the identity matrix. Uh, alpha is of course positive number, but a small positive number. And there is an upper limit on alpha such that the spectral radius of I minus alpha is strictly less than one. Now this is a purely linear algebra question. So I'm assuming that some of you can help me establish this result. So what should, how should I prove it? 
remember what we know is that the real part of eigenvalue of a is going to be strictly greater than zero. That's something we know. Okay, so what do we know? We know that real part of eigenvalue of A is greater than zero. Oh, and of course, yeah, that's it. That's all we know. <clears throat> okay, let's, so what's the eigenvalue of I minus alpha A? So the eigenvalues, so let's say lambda i is a plus jb. So j is the complex number uh, here. For this particular proof, j is a complex number. Uh, a is greater than zero by assumption because we have real part of lambda i a is greater than zero. So that's a, which is greater than zero. So lambda i of I minus alpha A, what is this equal to? What do you think, what should this value be equal to? Let me write it as AI plus JBI. Can everyone hear me? One minus AI plus JBI. One minus alpha AI. Alpha AI, sorry. J alpha BI, yeah. Okay. Um, now let's look at the, so in order to compute the spectral radius of I minus alpha A, I have to look at the absolute value of the lambda I of I minus alpha A. So the absolute value of one minus one minus alpha AI square plus alpha BI square. After some computation, I'm sure you can convince yourself that this is given by Okay, one minus two alpha AI plus alpha square, AI square plus BI square. When will this be less than one? Under what conditions would this be less than one? Remember, I need to pick alpha. So let's try to see under what conditions this would be less than one. I'm going to do some reverse engineering now in order to compute the value of, or the range of alpha under which this is less than one. So the reverse engineering method is as follows. One minus two alpha AI minus alpha square, less than one, this implies one gets canceled on both sides. Oh. And then I have two alpha AI is greater than alpha square, AI square plus PI square. This implies, so I know that because real value of AI is greater than, so AI is greater than zero because of the assumption, because of this assumption, so this AI square plus BI square is going to be strictly positive. So, and this AI is of course positive. So I can move things around and I get alpha should be less than two AI over AI squared plus BI square. Okay, and needless to say, we are always assuming that alpha must be positive. So we get an upper bound on alpha so that 
the so this implies alpha n zero implies Right, so I hope uh, everyone agrees with me on this statement. So if alpha is between zero and some positive number, then the absolute value of lambda i is going to be less than one. Now, what should I set alpha bar to be equal to? Remember alpha bar is the upper limit on alpha such that the spectral radius itself is small. So not just, so all eigenvalues must be less than one. Sorry, absolute value of all eigenvalues must be less than one. What should the value of alpha bar be? Someone wants to give it a shot. Can I take maximum over all i of 2ai over ai square plus bi square? So can alpha bar be max over i? Okay, so no, no answers, no one wants to guess. Well, you know, this, this will not work because we require this alpha to be less than 2ai over this number for all i. So therefore alpha bar must be minimum over all i 2ai over ai square plus bi square. If you pick your alpha bar to be this, then for every alpha in zero alpha bar, the spectral radius of i minus alpha a is going to be less than one. Okay. Any question so far? So what we have found is if A is such that the real part of eigenvalues of A is strictly greater than zero, then there is an alpha bar which is given here such that you pick any alpha with between zero and alpha bar, the spectral radius of I minus alpha A is strictly less than one. This is open interval by the way, so it's not closed. It's open on both the sides. Okay. All right, so we have, we now have three results at our hand. The first is I want the gradient of H Y star, sorry, I want the spectral radius of the gradient to be less than one. And in order to prove this result for a class of gradient descent type algorithms, we will need these two results. The first one is if you construct a matrix in this way, then Q positive definite and B full rank implies that real part of eigenvalue is greater than zero. And of course, uh, uh, 
what we show here in the third result is that such an A, if you have such a matrix A, then the spectral radius of I minus alpha A is less than one for alpha sufficiently small. Okay, so now I'm gonna use these three results to show that the Lagrangian method we had first talked about converges under certain conditions. Okay, so the Lagrangian method was Okay, this is our Lagrangian method. This is my H of XK and Lambda K. And I know that in the limit, the first derivative of Lagrangian will go to zero and the H of X bar, which is the limit, it will be equal to zero. So there is a fixed point. So X star lambda star is a fixed point of H. What's the gradient of H? Remember that the gradient has to be um, with respect to both X and lambda. So this is my y, y star here. What is the gradient of H? No thoughts. So it's gradient of X, gradient of X, sorry, L, X lambda. It's gradient of lambda, gradient of X, L, X lambda, gradient of X minus H. x gradient of lambda minus hx. Okay, now what would the expression be? What's, so this would be the second derivative of the Lagrangian. This would be minus gradient of hx. The gradient of lambda, gradient of x of lx lambda, what would this expression be equal to? So you're taking the derivative with respect to x and then you're taking the derivative with respect to lambda. Sorry, in, in the last derivative, what happened to the, to the alpha? Oh, uh, did I miss alpha? Oh, yes. Sorry. And shouldn't yes. there be a, uh, right. like one I, minus? Yeah, I minus alpha. Sorry, yeah. Oh, okay. I minus alpha was missing. Yes, you are right. 
thanks for pointing it out okay so this alpha gets multiplied to this big matrix and then you have an identity in the front so i have i minus alpha some large matrix uh, so what's the derivative with respect to x and lambda of the lagrangian gradient of hx transpose right gradient of hx transpose and what about gradient of lambda of minus hx? Well, minus hx doesn't depend on lambda, so it's equal to zero. Oh, there is i minus alpha. So, okay, so we have all the essential results. So at, at x star and lambda star, I need to show that the spectral radius of this matrix i minus alpha, let me call this A, has to be greater, has to be less than one. So this is A when I evaluate it as, how should I write it? So gradient of H of X star lambda star equals to I minus alpha A. Okay, so for small alpha, when is H going to be a contraction map around X star lambda star? Does the second derivative of the Lagrangian need to be uh, positive definite? And then right. um, the gradient H of X has to be full rank? That's right, perfect. So this map, so what is this descent algorithm, Lagrangian method? So this algorithm would converge if gradient H X star full rank and second derivative of Lagrangian at X star lambda star is positive definite, is strictly positive definite, okay? So if these two conditions are satisfied, so this would, so this would readily be satisfied if your function was convex and your uh, equality constraint was linear, so it's a totally convex problem, then the second derivative of Lagrangian will be positive definite at all places. And your gradient of HX would be a full rank matrix. So if these two conditions are satisfied, then this sort of Lagrangian method would converge to the fixed point, which is X star lambda star. Okay, so it will converge to X star lambda star if you start sufficiently close to X star and lambda star. Okay, so the contraction mapping theorem helps us establish the convergence of an algorithm that uh, someone concocted, um, you know, without, so, so someone gives me an algorithm and I need to establish the convergence. I can just go through the contraction mapping theorem result and establish the convergence for this algorithm. Now, one thing you will notice is requiring that the second derivative of Lagrangian be positive definite is too much. Like, I think it is just too much to ask for second derivative of Lagrangian to be positive definite. It will only happen in a very special class of convex problems. So how can we rectify the situation? That is, how can we come up with another set of algorithm which doesn't require such stringent assumption um, and perhaps only requires the sufficiency condition for optimality. So we have talked about it when we were talking about augmented Lagrangian method. How do you fix this problem? 
So we know that the second derivative of Lagrangian cannot be positive definite, but we know that second derivative of something else can be positive definite under some conditions. What was that condition? Let's, let's consider so let me use augmented Lagrangian. Okay, so remember we had mentioned, we had seen that if you have, if you pick a C which is sufficiently large, your augmented Lagrangian becomes convex in X. And we are going to exploit that property. So instead of picking the derivative of the usual Lagrangian, I'm going to pick the derivative of the augmented Lagrangian with C sufficiently large. So remember we had mentioned that C should be greater than two C bar. Um, so if you pick C sufficiently large, then this method would converge. So assuming uh, C is sufficiently large, second order sufficient condition is satisfied. Gradient of HX star is full rank this implies that this iteration would converge to X star lambda star. This is the um, augmented Lagrangian with the method of multipliers approach. Actually, it would be good to contrast this with the augmented Lagrangian approach. So, so any, any questions so far on this particular result? I just want to contrast this algorithm with the augmented Lagrangian method. So let me just write it here. Uh, how do I, well, let me just try to write it. So this is method of multipliers. We have XK plus one lambda K plus one, XK lambda K, minus alpha LCK XK lambda K and this was CK HXK. This was the method of multiplier. So this alpha oh, alpha K, uh, no, actually you were supposed to do the minimum here. Okay, let me write. Of course, the minimum will happen through a gradient descent approach. Okay, so this was our method of multipliers. Okay, and this particular is augmented. This is a, another type of augmented Lagrangian method. 
but here you don't have to do the argument over all x. You can just do the usual vanilla gradient descent. Um, and you don't have to use the CK, you can just use lambda K plus alpha HXK and it would still work. Okay. So all in all we have, what we have done so far is we have studied various types of algorithm for solving equality and inequality constraint problems. So we talked about barrier method, we talked about augmented Lagrangian method and the method of multipliers. So that was this method. Um, then we talked about penalty method where we came up with a non-differentiable penalty function and tried to do the global minimum of that function plus penalty function approach. And we transformed that problem into a sequential quadratic problem or sequential quadratic algorithm, which would eventually solve the problem. And then we talked about uh, the Lagrangian method, but the idea in Lagrangian method is you come up with an iteration, but then you have to prove that that iteration would converge to the optimal solution, not the optimal solution, but a point that satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. And in order to do that, we studied Banach contraction mapping theorem and we showed under in today's class that one can use contraction mapping theorem to identify conditions under which the uh, given algorithm would converge to the first order necessary to a point that satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. So this method is one such method where we can come up with some sufficient conditions and we could show that it would converge to X star lambda star and the proof is contraction mapping theorem. Now, if you refer to the book, it's not given in uh, such great detail. I mean, the proof of uh, the convergence using contraction mapping theorem is not given in as great detail as uh, we did in the class but I wanted to make sure that you all understand some of the essential steps in the proof so that you can replicate it in your future research or future work that you may be doing elsewhere. So contraction mapping theorem is truly powerful when you want to establish convergence of algorithms in a wide variety of uh, situations. Okay. So that's why I spent almost three lectures on using contraction mapping theorem to show convergence. So once we set up the theoretical framework and proved some essential consequences, uh, it became pretty straightforward to come up with a new algorithm and show that it converges. Okay, it's a, this is a good time to pause, think about what we have done and ask any questions you may have on contraction mapping theorem or its application to optimization. I'm I'm a little confused. So we use uh, the contraption mapping theorem here to prove that um, the methods or the um, yeah was this the algorithm. this algorithm converges. You want me to go over the proof? No. Um, Okay, but this is different from the method of multipliers? Yeah, so the method of multipliers is given in this box in black color. So XK plus one is the argument of the augmented Lagrangian and then Lambda K plus one is updated according to 
this update scheme. So lambda k plus c k h x k. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, this method is completely different. So what you're doing is you're taking a step x k minus alpha gradient of x l c, which is not doing the argument. You're not really doing the argument here. You're just subtracting from x k a gradient of the augmented Lagrangian with some step size alpha. And okay. you're, not, you're not really adding lambda k plus c h x k, which is what you would do in method of multipliers. Remember there is the c k term here. So we're not doing that. We're just adding lambda k plus alpha h x k. So you're just adding a small step size plus the h of x k as to, to lambda k in order to update lambda k. Okay. Yeah. Does this one, did we give this one a particular name? No, it's, it doesn't have a particular name in the book. It just uh, augmented Lagrangian way of doing updates. I mean, it, it doesn't have a specific method, or a specific name in the book. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So for this one, we have to make sure first that C is sufficiently large. That it that's right. Convert. That's the only way in which this will converge. Correct. Because then you know that your LC is strong, is strictly convex. Uh, sorry, yeah, the LC is strictly convex in X. And so you don't really need the second derivative to be positive definite. You only need the second derivative of LC to be positive definite, will be, which will be satisfied if C was very large. Okay. Yeah. I just want to check once that I have, yeah, I think I have minus B transpose here. Yeah. Any other question? Um, so in this case, C should be greater than two C bar. That's just, right. That's um, right. C bar is maybe, do we have it somewhere in our notes, right? Yeah, it should be somewhere in the notes. I don't remember where. No. Okay, I'll go through them and figure out what. Yeah, I I don't remember where I had written it. Perhaps lecture twenty would be the place. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so lecture twenty is where we had talked about it. So when c is greater than two c bar, the method of multipliers will converge. And that's when the LC is going to be strongly convex. Okay, but for each unique problem, we'd have to calculate what the C bar is. That's right, that's okay. right, yeah. So I think here I had mentioned that when C is greater than one, then LC becomes convex. And when C is greater than two C bar, so this is the C bar. And when C is greater than two C bar, then uh, the method of multipliers would converge, but in order for having convexity, you only need C to be greater than C bar. Yeah, but yes, you are right that in every problem, you will have to try and estimate what the value of C should be. And what I would say is, you know, whenever such a situation arises, you really have to bank on your practical experience with that problem to identify what that parameter C bar or C should be. Okay. Okay. All right. So if there are no further questions, I want to start a new topic, which is geometric multiplier theory. Okay. Let me start with some uh, motivation for studying the geometric multiplier theory. So until now, we required F and H and everything to be convex. So the drawbacks of the current approaches, we require F, H, G to be differentiable and 
we obtained all necessary conditions slash sufficient condition in terms of derivative of f g f h and g okay so so far we have been coming up with algorithms um, to compute the optimal solution uh, using some sort of gradient based approaches okay now consider the situation where you want to solve problems where you need to schedule services or schedule human resources for solving some problem and those situations are inherently what is known as integer valued so the space x would be 0 1 raised to n which means that x can only take two values 0 or or, or xi can take only two values 0 or 1 okay so so how would you go about solving such problems using differentiable approaches? And the idea is uh, you really can't use the approaches where you require the underlying space to be continuous and the functions to be differentiable. So you want to come up with a theory that is somewhat more general and can accommodate situations where you cannot really use differentiability type approaches. So this gap is filled by geometric multiplier theory. So how do we, how do we get around the difficulty of non-differentiability of the functions and so on? Uh, let's, let's try to, let me try to give you an intuitive explanation, which won't really be intuitive right now, but hopefully, in a couple of classes or in a week or so, it would become intuitive about how can we get around this differentiability assumption. So, so far we were looking at iterations in the X and Lambda space, which is Rn cross Rn cross Rm. So these were the iterations that we were looking at in the Lagrange multiplier. M U L flyer approaches. Now I'm going to look at the space with FX and GX. And well, yeah, let me use GX because right now we are going to be looking at inequality constraint problems. And we are just going to look at the geometry of this set. The set is X in capital X. Um, so, and we are going to look at the geometry. Okay, so we form vectors of FX and GX for all X in capital X or all X in the set capital X. And we are just going to look at the geometry of such set. And based on the geometry, we can actually come up with really powerful tools to solve optimization problems that you could not have envisioned solving using the Lagrange multiplier methods. Okay, just by changing. So this is the domain space. And this is of course the range space. So you're looking at the range of the function f and g. Here you're looking at the domain of the function f and h. And by going from the domain space to the range space, you can actually come up with really powerful tools uh, using the geometric multiplier theory. Okay, so we can come up with powerful algorithms using geometric multiplier theory. So that's the basic introduction to geometric multiplier theory. 
let's dive into it. And the first topic under this um, umbrella is duality. I want to minimize f of x. x is in capital X such that gx is less than or equal to zero. And right now I won't make any assumptions on the set X. So the set X could be integer valued. It could be zero one binary valued uh, or it could be Euclidean valued. It doesn't matter. It's just some set. Let's say the minimum value is F star. So this is the optimal value. Okay, I'm going to make two assumptions. The first assumption is I want F star to be finite. So I don't want a situation where the infimum, you can change this minimum to infimum, which is what we want to solve. So Let's consider a situation where infimum does not exist. So the infimum is equal to minus infinity or something. So I want to not consider those situations. So I want my F star to be strictly less than infinity. And I want my, um, the set X in capital X such that GX less than or equal to zero is non-empty. So as you go into more generality, you have to make assumptions such that your situation is not vacuous. So one such assumption is I want to have at least one point that satisfies the constraint. Okay, so you can't have a situation where you have X square less than minus, less than equal to minus one. I mean, this is not feasible. So you want to avoid such possibilities, such pathological cases when you are solving optimization problems in full generality. Okay, we define the usual Lagrangian L of X comma mu as FX plus mu transpose GX. This is our usual definition of Lagrangian. And now that all this thing is set up, I can actually write the first definition. And this is the definition for geometric multipliers. So mu star in RR is geom is geometric multiplier. Let me say is called is said to be if and only if there are two conditions. The first condition is mu star has to be non-negative. And the second condition is F star should be infimum X in X, L of X mu star.
okay i have a non negative vector such that if i take the infimum of the lagrangian over the set so this is not the set of feasible points this is the this is the entire set itself if i take the infimum my f star uh, it's the infimum is equal to f star okay so if these two conditions are satisfied then mu star is a geometric multiplier for the original problem okay let's look at an example i want to minimize e raised to x such that x is less than equal to 0 x is in r so let me define the set so capital x is the set of real line g of x is equal to x f of x is equal to e raised to x is this a convex problem what do you think is this a convex problem yes no can't say uh because of the exponential function would be say that it it is convex right so it's convex because f is convex and g is convex okay so it's a convex problem so the first conclusion it's it's a convex problem now the second question is what's f star equal to what's the infimum in this problem what do you think what is the infimum zero zero where will that be attained be minus infinity right yeah it will be minus infinity so so this infimum will actually not be attained on the real line it will be attained at minus infinity which is of course not part of the real line okay so in some in some sense this has no optimal solution in this particular problem so uh, everything that we have studied so far doesn't apply in this situation because there is no optimal solution to begin with now let's see whether i can compute a geometric multiplier for this problem so let me write my l of x comma mu e raised to x plus mu times x okay i want to find a mu star which is non negative such that if i take the infimum of the lagrangian over the entire real line so remember my x is the real line itself so that if i take the infimum of the lagrangian over the real line it's equal to 0 that's all i need to 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 show to come up with mu star so what would be a candidate mu star where this would be satisfied so i need mu star greater than 0 such that 0 equals to infimum of l of x comma mu star x in r what do you think what would the possible mu star be so let's set mu star equal to 0 my lagrangian is exactly equal to e raised to x and it satisfies this equality so 0 is equal to the infimum over x in r of l of x comma mu star so indeed i have a lagrange multiplier i have a geometric multiplier in this problem so mu star is the geometric multiplier
Okay, so we have a convex problem where there is no optimal solution. So therefore, there is no question of computing an X star or a lambda star. But actually, there is a hope of computing a geometric multiplier because it doesn't require existence of an optimal solution. All it requires is that it be non-negative and that F star be the infimum of the Lagrangian over the entire set X. Okay, and that's what we have demonstrated through this example. So geometric multipliers can exist even though Lagrange multipliers need not exist or, or uh, you know, the problem itself need not have an optimal solution. So we'll take this concept a little forward and understand the geometric properties of the set uh, Fx Gx over all X and capital X. And by studying the geometric properties of this particular set, we can actually come up with very uh, sophisticated algorithms uh, through the use of what is known as weak duality theorem. So we'll talk about it in the next class on Friday. If you have any questions, I'm gonna stick around, uh, but feel free to leave if you want to. Why is the, is it pronounced infinum? Right, so because in this case, we are not going to assume that an optimal solution exists in all the problems that we may potentially solve using duality. Okay, why, why is the infinum of the Lagrangian uh, oh. with mu star, why is that equal to zero? Oh yeah, of course. So let's, what is infimum of e raised to x, x in r? Uh, I thought we said that was negative infinity. No, so, so x, so this is actually, infimum is zero because e raised to x is always non-negative. So e raised to minus infinity is zero. So minus infinity comes here. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> right, but e raised to x is always greater than or equal to zero. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Any other question? Professor, what does duality mean? Duality. Uh, okay, so the reason why, so uh, the reason why we call it duality theorem or duality theory is because we will talk about two problems here. One is the primal problem and the dual problem. So the primal problem would be minimize of fx such that gx less than equal to zero, x in some set capital X. The dual problem will be maximization of q of mu. So we'll define this function q in the next class where mu is in D, okay? And the weak or, or the strong duality theorem which we will talk about in, a, in, in, a, in next week, we will show that under some conditions on the function F and G, this is actually equal. <clears throat> Moreover, the optimal solution to this would be equal to mu star. Mu star will be the arg max. And the optimal solution here would be your X star. And this mu star would be a geometric multiplier to the primal problem. So you can compute X star as argument of L X comma mu star, X in capital X. And based on this uh, duality approach, which is you look at the primal problem, you look at the dual problem, now you can have iterative schemes where you update the primal, primal xk and then you update the dual mu k and then you update primal xk and then update the dual mu k and so on and so forth. So think about method of multipliers. That was a type of primal dual algorithm where you were updating the primal uh, variable and then you were updating the dual variable. But of course, at that time, we didn't really talk about duality. Now you can view that from the lens of duality.
but but you know in that situation lamb the update for lambda k is not necessarily a a solution to an optimization problem so this primal dual method will actually give you much more sophisticated algorithms for uh, general optimization algorithm including integer optimization algorithms so that's what it means to have duality so duality means you have two things that you can play with and here we'll have two things to play with which is primal problem and dual problem does that make sense yes thank you so much yeah sure okay so i'll see you guys on friday <laughs>